Hi, welcome to Live Right Tonight. I am Brandy, and I have the privilege of having Jay Armstrong. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing good. Jay, if you can, please tell us a little about yourself. Uh, well, I'm a, a 43-year-old uh, American man who happens to be a, uh, a drunk and a junkie uh, who's not currently actively using, and it's been quite a while. Uh, I'm an addict. I'm an alcoholic. I, uh, I, I, I get weird about those, uh, those labels because, like, all the, the addiction that I ran into, like, it started because of the problems that I was experiencing with alcohol pretty early. So, you know, people like to argue, do you say alcoholic? Do you say addict? Do you say both? Do you say some ridiculous special nonsense to get attention? Uh, which, uh, I don't know, man. That's why I typically just say I'm a drunk and a junkie, you know, just removed from the substances. Uh, grew up in Northern Kentucky, still currently live in the greater Cincinnati area. Uh, although uh, I've been all over the country, you know, I lived in California for a bit. I've lived all over Ohio. Uh, been sober since November 8th, 2005. I guess that's a key piece, right? Uh, that's awesome. I get, uh, I don't know, I get weird about those dates. Everywhere you go in the country, everybody's got a weird, uh, you know, whoever woke up this morning has been sober the longest, you know, or something like that. I don't, I don't want to offend any of those people on any sides. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I'm just trying to make it through another day. You know, uh, I don't have to be right. I'd rather be happy. Uh, Right. I'm a married guy. I've got a, uh, we have a blended family with a total of five kids. I'm a grandfather, uh, which is so strange. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I wasn't supposed to live anywhere near this long. And yet here I am as a grandpa, you know, and I wanted that to be weird. You know what I mean? Cause I'm, I'm too young, right? I'm too young to be a grandfather, but uh, I'm a great aunt. You're good. Right? <laughs> when, uh, when my daughter was born, I was 22. When my granddaughter was born, my daughter was 18. So that's not like a tragedy. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not one of those things where everybody's like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm just old. I'm just old enough for it, which is so <laughs> strange. I never expected to see 21. Right. I don't know how much farther you want me to go unprompted. No, you're you're doing great. Um, so one thing I do know about you, you are a comedian. Yes, ma'am. And um, how long have you been doing that? Uh, about 12 years. It'll be okay. 13 this August. Awesome. And um, <laughs> um, again, uh, just want our viewers to know that we aren't going to sit there and get too far in detail because I want them all to come and visit you at our Spring Spectacular March 21st. And we're going to have more of you there. So I'm excited. Um, one thing I did... Um, I did go through some of your um, interviews and you saying that you've gone through these addictions. Now, one thing I do know that you were adopted, you were adopted, you were two months old. Am I correct? When you were adopted? Two weeks. I two was weeks. two weeks when I went home with them. And then okay. I think at two months is when it was finalized or whatever. Okay. Now, one thing I do know is that you were talking about how you always felt different. You weren't, you never felt really connected. Right. Is that the word? Now, is that what kind of drove you towards going through the addiction to the disease? Uh, I Well, so, I mean, the real truth of the matter is I don't have an answer for that, right? I just don't. You know, I mean, I can say that I self-medicated quite a bit as a, as a young person who didn't feel like things were right. Uh, there's some, uh, there was some trauma. Uh, in, in the video that you saw from me where I went kind of into detail, uh, I skipped over all the childhood trauma stuff. And uh, I'm not, I'm not going to get specific about it here either uh, because I'm, I worry about legal issues because that family that adopted me uh, that I didn't feel connected to, I'm currently in the middle of a legal battle with uh, to get them out of my life permanently. Okay. Uh, but, you know, so... I got bullied pretty brutally, uh, middle school and high school. Uh, so, I mean, I could say that there was some self-medication. I, you know, I've been diagnosed with PTSD, uh, major depressive disorder, you know, generalized anxiety disorder, all that stuff. And, and I don't know, you know, the trauma that I experienced, I was real, real young. And I don't know, because of being that young, I don't have like a baseline for what was normal prior to that. 
you know, so I, I can say that I was self-medicating and then that those issues and that way that I felt is what drove me into addiction. Uh, but I, but I honestly, I don't know, you know, and it would be academic right. to know at this point for me anyway. Uh, maybe if I was a part of some, you know, double blind peer reviewed empirical study, uh, that information would be more important. But uh, I think the important thing is that when I did find uh, those substances, uh, they changed the way that I felt completely. Uh, I no longer felt different than everybody. I felt fine. I felt normal. I felt the way that other people look on the outside. You know what I mean? I felt right. okay for the first time ever. And I definitely chased feeling okay. And then after I stopped, you know, when okay wasn't enough, I started, you know, chasing, chasing that high, you know, or that, that drunk, trying to get back to feeling that trying okay. to get past it. You know what I mean? So if a little bit gets me okay, a lot is going to get me better. That's just right. how I saw it. And, you know, to some extent, that's still how I look at life today. You know what I mean? If a little coffee is fine, then a ton of coffee is going to be better, right? Obviously, <laughs> that's just how an addict's brain works, I guess. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, the I definitely have the genetic predisposition, you know. But th that's one of the things that I think we gloss over a whole lot, you know, especially when we start talking about opiate narcotics because, you know, drug addicts and alcoholics were really only about 10 to 15 percent, 20 percent on the high end from some estimates, you know, the general population. And anyone, anyone can become physically dependent upon alcohol or opiate narcotics. Now, the question is, is once you send them through detox, say, you know, only 10 to 15 out of 100 are going to go back after they've gone through the detox because they don't have the genetic predisposition to be a real addict. Uh, and I kept going back, man. And uh, no matter how many times, uh, a psych ward after psych ward after psych ward, because in my early days, you know, uh, there wasn't this epidemic of uh, rich suburban white kids dying, which drives politicians to open <clears throat> up treatment centers, mm -hmm. uh, or at least to clear the pathway to open up those treatment centers. And, you know, that's one of the most controversial things that I talk about anymore is when that that moment changed from when I had to go to the psych ward to when there was an actual detox available. And uh, the real truth of the matter is, is rich suburban white kids started getting hooked on the same dirty inner city drugs that I was doing. And now people care. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I just kept going back. No matter how many times I would detox, I would be right back at it. You know, and I always had a new plan, you know, because ad addicts are, are uh, resourceful, and manipulative, even with themselves. You know, I always told myself, you know, if I, if I, uh, if I only use for two or three days, I won't develop a habit. I'll be fine. And, and then that's a fact. That's a true fact, right? If I only use a couple of days in a row, <laughs> I won't develop a habit. Right, the problem right. is, is that if at the beginning, right, if I only use a couple of days in a row, I personally completely lack the ability to do that. I can't control it. And that's the thing, you know, even looking back at how dumb I was is, is uh, you know, teenage years, early 20s, I just couldn't get it through my head that like I don't have the ability to consume the substances I see other people consuming and not ruining their lives. I just lack right. that ability and it was hard to get that through my head. Uh, and even after I got it through my head, you know, I had to get to a point where I would care about myself enough for it to matter. You know, I was on a suicide mission for a couple of decades. Uh, I mean, I moved, I moved to San Francisco to die. Like that was the goal going out there. Like I'm not coming back. And uh, yeah, here I am, <laughs> you know, all these years later. Uh, with, with a clean day, you know what I mean? With a sobriety day, with a family that loves me, people that respect me, with uh, with a story that goes from, you know, bottom of the barrel to standing up and being an adult, contributing member of society and, uh, and a father and a grandfather, uh, that, that's powerful enough to uh, where strangers find me on the internet, you know, and that's so weird to me to this day, you know, and, when people contact me out of the blue, I never know if it's because of they saw that video uh, where I tell my story or uh, or comedy. You know, I don't know because I've made some pretty good progress with comedy until COVID hit. And now we're in a weird space with it. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I'm i not chasing it like I once was uh, <clears throat> because I'm not sure what the roadmap looks like now because it's so different than it was. You know, yeah. I'm just uh, I'm doing what they taught me in recovery in the early days and put one foot in front of the other and I'm going to the next right thing to the best of my ability. You know? yep. It's all you can do, honestly. 
right. you know, one day at a time. <laughs> um, so, uh, now when you started your addiction, now you were about 14, am I correct? Uh, the first time that I drank alcohol, I was roughly 12. Okay. Okay. And then, uh, start, started, uh, I don't know how, uh, your organization is getting real specific. Some of the groups that I talk to want to use real generic blanket terms like drugs or whatever. But, uh, you know, I started smoking cannabis at like 13. And, uh, you know, this is a weird thing that I talk about too, because I, I just, don't, I don't know the answer to this. Uh, I grew up in Northern Kentucky, right? Like uh, rural suburban. Mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't have a lot of like wild drugs. You know what I mean? Just in my town. Like, yeah, there was a couple of old stoners and some old deadheads that were still, you know, selling acid or whatever. But, you know, I had never seen anybody smoke cannabis. I had never heard of anybody taking PCP or using cocaine or anything right. until I encountered a little program in the fifth grade called DARE. Uh, <laughs> and the DARE program, and, and my experience, it taught me about all these things that would make me feel better than I already felt. You know what I mean? And uh, when I found some people at 13 that did, you know, that were family members that, that consumed cannabis, uh, I was like, well, they're not like the evil monsters that Officer Burke taught me about and dare. You know, why would he lie? And if he lied about those people, did he lie about the people who were using cocaine and heroin? And uh, so I, my fear of anybody who used any substance is that they tried to build in me like they did the opposite. You know, because right. as soon as I found out they were lying about weed, I was like, they, they got to be lying about other stuff. People don't pick and choose where they lie most of the time. It's, it's not just one little thing. It's a ton, you know, to to manipulate children into, uh, I guess not, uh, I don't know, the way, I guess the way that I look at it is if you don't want kids uh, to go see the movie, you don't show them the trailer, right? Mm. What you do is you show them a documentary about yeah. what really happened instead of trying to scare these kids straight. You know, it just doesn't work. Not for somebody like me. Like I was already miserable. Like the life that I had was... <laughs> was so terrifying every day that whatever that their officer told me about seemed like a better option. So <laughs> right. at, at 14 was the first time that a treatment professional told me that I was an alcoholic. Uh, at 16 is when I started shooting dope and uh, I was way ahead of the curve. We're talking 1996 in Cincinnati. Uh, and the first time that I got arrested for possession of heroin was uh, 2000. And uh, man, you would have thought that I murdered an entire school with the way that they treated me in that courtroom because they just weren't seeing it then, you know and, and they see somebody with with heroin with real heroin I was, i'll tell you this it scared them so much that the amount that i had that i got busted with that first time was residue an amount described in court is too small for it to be possible to be measured and they gave me three years wow now how many like have you um have you ever gone into treatment, like rehabs? Anything? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How many times have, have you gone into uh, rehab? Twice. Twice. And if you don't I mind. I say me twice. Technically three times for, for inpatient places. Now I've done some outpatient as well, uh, you know, and and juvenile probation at, at 16 was when they started court ordering me to 12-step programs, you know, and I meet a lot of people that uh, they get frustrated with people relapsing and whatever. And I don't want to say this in a way that, that makes it sound like I think it's cool to relapse because I don't, because eventually you're going to find the one that you don't come back from, right? But right. just to throw some hope out there to some people that have been struggling or they got a family member struggling. The first time I was court ordered to a 12-step meeting was 1996, and my sobriety date is November 8th, 2005. You know, so there was a lot of struggle in that time. Right. Uh, you know, the biggest chunk of my addiction was in that time was after that first you know, meeting that I got that pulled into. And that's not because they didn't work. It was because I absolutely 100 percent was not ready at 16. You know, what right. I mean, I just found the thing that pulled me out of the, the, the obsession to take my own life. You know what I mean? I'm definitely not ready to, to go back and, you know, just experience that from, you know, because I started experiencing the suicidal ideation around seven years old. Right. right. And uh 
at 13, I found out how to push those thoughts away, you know, and uh, cause I don't know if you, if you deal with any OCD or any uh, intrusive thoughts that you just cannot get rid of. And that's one of the things about OCD. A lot of people don't realize they think about counting things and opening and closing doors the right amount of time, but it's the obsessive thought that gets into my head that I cannot get rid of that actually causes me an issue. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, but, uh, yeah, at 16, you know, you're telling me I've had three years of reprieve from this suicidal obsession and you want me to go right back to it? No, I'm not doing that, you know. Uh, the place where I finally went where it was the, uh, was what I w- I needed when I was ready. I actually, so let's say this, uh, in 2004, I went to the psych ward again and they told me that people that start shooting heroin as young as I did and continue for as long as I did, they don't get well, they die. You know, that's what a psychiatrist, Dr. Rodriguez, told me right to my face. I had no hope and no chance. Uh, but since I had never been to long-term inpatient treatment, he was going to send me to this 28-day program. And I was like, that doesn't really seem, you know, like long-term to me. Uh, the place that I went to before that, uh, in 01, right when I got that possession charge, or well, once I got sentenced, they they offered me this probation bureau where I would go to rehab, and it was a religious-based rehab, and there was zero certifications in this place, man, and uh, there were zero treatment professionals, so I don't, so when I say two, kind of three, that's the one that I'm talking about, that's kind of, I do believe that those people had good intentions, uh, but they just didn't have the know-how or the experience, you know, and, and I, People don't realize how much harm that causes. Just because you're out there running, trying to help people, you have this idea that I want to help people. That doesn't mean you're not creating more harm. Right. You know. But uh, and, and the reason that I ask myself questions like that is because uh, a class that I went to at that the, the last rehab that I went to called the Healing Place in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, we did a class uh, once a week called Help or Harm because sometimes you don't know, you know, so you have to be willing to to understand that. Just because your intentions are good does not mean that the thing that you're doing is helpful to anyone, uh, right. even yourself, you know. So, but <clears throat> I went to a place called the Falmouth <throat> Care Unit for those 28 days because I was willing to do whatever. And when I got there, man, I met all these dudes from this one particular 12 step group. And I will not say what 12 step group that I'm a part of or which meetings they have at that or whatever. But uh, this guy, man, he's wearing a suit and tie basically. Excuse me. Well, he's wearing a dress shirt and a tie. That's a suit and tie for me. You know, uh, I'm a scum. I'm an alleyway junk. You know what I mean? I'm a homeless scumbag. That's who I am. I might be removed from that. But at that time, I was not. You know, so I got this right. guy who's like this yuppie office dude. He's like, what are you here for? And I was like, well, I actually went to the psych ward. I told him I was going to kill myself. And uh, he's like, is that what you want to do? And I was like, I mean, yeah, dude. But I don't want to fail, right? Like, I don't want to end up handicapped or just disfigured like my life's bad enough you know so i had seen this barbara walters special when i was like 15 or 16 about all these people that had attempted suicide and failed and that stopped me from going through with the plans that i had probably 200 times you know right i just didn't want to be worse you know i don't right I don't make it <laughs> it's like if i'm gonna do it i gotta succeed right yeah i don't want to be like vincent van gogh with half a year and then have to suffer for hours with a gunshot wound to the belly you know? right uh, and uh, you know and i'm talking to this guy and he was like look here's the deal man he's like come with us do what we do do it for six months right and if at the end of it life's not any better you can still kill yourself and i was like i'm willing to make that deal you know i am and at the time that's what i needed and uh you know so i started doing that work and i got to a point where i felt better you know at about nine months and uh i stopped doing the work uh, because the, the guy that was like my mentor at the time, he, uh, there was no, nothing to report back to him at that point, you know, like I'm, I'm out there making amends. I'm just, you know, yeah, I'm making amends. You're, I don't got to write anything down and show them, you know what I mean? Or any of that stuff. So I just started lying. You know, when you're sick, don't take medicine. That's how I looked at it. And it was a pretty short order that I started using, you know, I relapsed full, full force. And, uh, within a few months, you know, I find myself, uh, begging God to stop me from doing what I'm doing. And he sent help in the way of the Northern Kentucky Drug Task Force. Uh, And they took me and I got another possession charge and a persistent felony offender charge. And uh, this time they offered me treatment at a real long-term inpatient program. And uh, a friend of mine's mother 
a friend of mine who had passed away when I was in prison the first time. Uh, his mom got real busy here in the state of Kentucky. I uh, got a law passed named after him. Uh, it's an interesting law, and it's been replicated all over the country at this point. It's the Matthew Casey Weathington Law. It's you can uh, petition a court to put a family member or a loved one at least through a uh, addiction uh, that's what I'm looking for uh, assessment to see if they need treatment, even if they're over 18. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it's it's weird though because like uh, I mean, I grew up with. And his mom was actually my second grade teacher. He and I were friends. Uh, when he passed, she started visiting me uh, in prison. And now I meet these people in recovery who tell me that they're here today uh, because of Casey's Law. And uh, to meet someone who has hope again, whose family has their loved one again, uh, because someone I cared about is gone, it gives some uh, some meaning, you know, to that loss. Uh, and it's been it's been you know get, seeing hope inspired in other people is is kind of a uh, it's been a theme, you know. It's been the uh, the most joyous occasions uh, of my recovery. You know, uh, I went and performed. So I got sober in Louisville. That's where uh, the treatment center that I went to was. Okay. And uh, at about, I don't know, I guess I had 14, 13 years. So it was right before COVID hit. I went and performed at a comedy club in Louisville, uh, which is about two hours south where I live. And, uh, you know, I, I said, you know, at the end of my set, hey, you know, the jokes are over. But I just want to let you know that I appreciate this town and all of you that work to donate or whatever it is to, you know, this one particular facility because it saved my life. I wouldn't be here today without it. So okay. this city has a special place in my heart and all you people that live here do too. And uh, a lady uh, came running at me after the show uh, and she grabbed me and pulled me outside. And she said, the place that you went to uh, was a healing place. And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, my son's there right now. And man, she broke down crying. It was like the 12th or 13th place that he had been, you know, and, I've got this woman holding on to me, crying, thanking me for breathing. You know what I mean? It's such a weird experience. Right. Uh, sorry for getting emotional, man. I started talking no, about you're Casey. fine. You're I'm getting me fine. emotional. I'm seeing them watching you. <laughs> it's just... So one of the things that she said that Casey's mother said to me when she came to visit me the first time, uh, or no, it was the first letter that she sent me. Uh, she sent me a letter and she said that Casey told us about the troubles that he's been having with opiate narcotics. And uh, when he first told me, I thought that a problem like that would never show its face at our house. Mm -hmm. And now Casey's gone and you have another opportunity at life. And uh, I will never forget that. You know what I mean? I just, it stays strong in my head. You know, whether I'm doing good or doing bad, you know, uh, I've had some pretty miserable experiences, you know, in recovery. You know, right. a lot of times people just want to talk about what comedy's like, and, uh, you know, chasing that dream because that, you know, it is a dream. And, you know, I've done some things that I never thought I would ever be able to do. Uh, but more importantly, you know, uh, making it through those those hard times, you know, uh, I've been homeless, I've been divorced, I've been married. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I've been through with the ringer. Uh, the people that claim to love me and be my family sued me even after they harmed uh, another member of my family, you know? And uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's been a wild ride, you know? Right. Uh, the important thing is don't drink or use no matter what, you know? Absolutely. And it took, it took a lot of work to get to that point, you know, to where I even had the ability to not drink or use no matter what. You know, when people first show up, we want them to, we, we assume that people have the same point of reference, right? You, you right. just assume that people know what you know and think what you think and, and have the motivations that you have. And, you know, so when you're 20 years clean and sober and you tell a new guy, just sit on your hands, you know, that's, it's not helpful. You know, uh, no. they got to get that work done, whether it's a 12 step group. And that's the thing that I stress all the time because I've done the work from several programs at this point. But 
the important thing is that somebody grabbed me early on and was like, don't mix and match. You're going to hear people in meetings tell you to take what you want, leave the rest. You don't know what you want or need. So you're just going to take it all. You're going to yeah. do it all. And then if you want to do something else later, once we do this, then we can move on to that. Right. You know, so they said, we're going to go through 12 steps. We're not going to go through 24 or 36. We're going to do 12 in a row the way that they're outlined in this book. And then if you want to go, you know, pursue more than that, you know, feel free. You know, it's not going to cause you any harm to, to do more work on yourself. And, uh, you know, when people want to talk to me, you know, at, at a one-on-one -on -one level, I'm willing to tell them, you know, like what I went through first and what I went through after that, what I do today. Uh, but every one of those groups has, you know, that anonymity at the level of press, radio, phone, and social media. And uh, I actually got the opportunity to visit the uh, the general service office for Alcoholics Anonymous uh, when I was in New York City. And uh, they told me, they were like, you can take pictures of any of these artifacts that you want, but they can't be selfies. You can't be ill. And I was like, really? I was like, that's interesting. They were like, we don't want you to break your anonymity. And I was like, well, you know, and... Uh, I was trying to tell, I didn't want to tell her, hey, I'm not a member, but so it's not my anonymity. You know what I mean? Like, right. I don't know. Uh, but I also don't want to say that I'm not a member either. I don't know. It's uh, it's a weird fine line to walk with those traditions, but those traditions, and there's a reason that every one of those groups has adopted them, you know, and, yeah. and it's because we watched the blood and, you know, sweat and tears of those that came before us, you know, everybody, uh, Excuse me. A lot of people, I say everybody, that's hyperbolic. Most people in uh, in recovery understand that the 12 steps as we know them today, you know, started in 1934. But there were groups prior to that, like the Washingtonians and the Emanuel movement. And so some of those traditions that all those groups have uh, uh, adopted, uh, they come from the pain of someone else. So like the Washingtonians, they got involved in the abolition of slavery back in the 1800s. And that political excursion is what fractured their group and destroyed them, you know? Right. Uh, so that a, that this group has no opinion on outside issues, hence our name should never be drawn to public controversy. That's not just somebody wanting to be a jerk and shut people up about what they think, feel, and believe. You know what I mean? That's because people are dead because a group didn't do that. You know, uh, you know, we're self-supporting through our own contributions is, is one of those for all those 12 step groups. And that's because the Rockefellers tried to buy Bill Wilson and, and Dr. Bob in the early days about all it's anonymous. Like there's reasons for all of those things. And whether you're in N.A. or A.A. or C.A. or H.A. or rational recovery or any of those things, like the history of alcoholism and drug addiction can give you some insight and maybe some understanding uh, into why things are done the way that they're done, because it's not just somebody in charge decided, you know, right. like, there's been enough pain caused by not following those things, you know. Right. Absolutely. Now, what inspires you every day to continue to stay clean and staying focused with your recovery? Um, I don't know that it's an option not to do that. I, I don't know that I need to be inspired. It was, uh, it was instilled in me, you know, that, that it's, uh, it's not an option. You know what I mean? I, I go about this with the desperation of a drowning man, you know, uh, okay. you know, obviously I don't want to, uh, I don't want to cause any harm to my family. You know what I mean? So our older kids uh, are not mine biologically, but the younger ones that are have never seen me drink or use ever. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I would like to keep it that way, but to suggest that that inspires me, you know, as a, let, here's the real truth. The, the, the thing that it keeps me inspired in this work is grace, period. It doesn't, begin in me and I don't deserve it and I didn't hurt you know uh yeah that's that that's it it's grace it's not me you know what I mean I don't have a uh, a philosophy of life that drives me to be a better person you know what I mean it's, this gift of recovery is is it right 
Well, I don't want to get too much deeper into anything because, again, I want everybody to come meet you and hear your story at our Spring Spectacular. And um, for what I did get from you today, I want to do some jokes there. So, so yeah, when I, when I, when <laughs> I, I also when I... watched some of your comedies. <laughs> it was great. I loved it. Um, but like I said, I don't want to get too in detail because I want everybody to come and meet you and you know hear what you have to say and listen to your you know your your comics because again you are you are hilarious. I watched a few of them and it was great. Um, but. For what you did tell us today, I want to say thank you. Um, thank you for allowing us to get into some of your personal, you know, personal life. Um, some of the things that you went through, the 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 thoughts and everything that you've you've gone through and what you're still going through, you know, because it is an everyday situation. Um, you know, and again, yeah, I still do the work. Absolutely, I still do. I don't go to nearly as many meetings as I used to. Because I'm on the road all the time, you know, and I'm not on the road as much as I used to be, but it used to be a constant thing. So I would try my best to hit any kind of meeting. You know what I mean? I would end up in these methamphetamine anonymous meetings and I was never a, really an addict to meth, you know, but that camaraderie, you know, but I would go into those meetings that I didn't really fit into and just shut my mouth and listen and then shake hands and hug people and make that connection that I feel like I, I need. You know? Right. Uh, but yeah, continuing to do the work. <laughs> that, that, that's that's the key. Yes, absolutely. But Jay, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me today. And um, I can't wait to meet you on March 21st. <laughs> it should be a good time, man. I, it's going to be a great serious, time. But, it's going to be a great thing. Like when they first talked to me about it, they were like, we want you to tell your story, but we also want you to do some jokes. And it's like, when I speak, uh, it's not fun. You know what I mean? Like, I, I get asked to speak at a lot of places once because they think I'm going to come in and it's going to be a great time. Then I start listing the hundreds of people that I buried. <laughs> it's not it's not a great time or fun for you by any form. Uh, so I don't know how I'm going to split it up. I don't. So uh, come and watch me fail. I know some of you out there just like watching people struggle. So come and see that struggle. If you like you comedy, know, come see the comedy. If you want some recovery story, you know, come and get, you know, it'll, it'll be a buffet, whatever you're looking for. <laughs> and you know what? Everything is a learning process. And to sit there and watch and hear someone go through a lot of traumatic, I don't know, for me, it's, it's a good insight because you know, for myself, I've gone through a lot and, you know, you talking about PTSD and everything else like that, I suffer with that. And to hear somebody that still does it, you know, still goes through it, you know, like when you got emotional, you got me emotional. And it's like, it's not that it's a bad thing. It just shows that there's people out there that has a heart that care, even not even knowing you, I, I don't know you. And I'm still like, I can feel your pain. I, I can have that emotion with you and that it just, it's, it, it means a lot, you know, in so many different levels, just your, you speaking hits in different aspects. And, you know, you might think that it's a failing to me. I got something out of it, you know? And, uh, you know, I, again, I just, I want to say thank you. <laughs> I don't want to get emotional here, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, um, I want to say thank you, and I appreciate you doing this with me today. And um, I can't wait to meet you March 21st. <laughs> I'm excited, man. I'll see you guys on the 21st. All right. Again, thank you so much for joining. Have a good day. You too.